Hello, I'm Fran Bell, Church Development Officer with the Diocese of Lincoln. Welcome to this presentation entitled, How to Get Your Church Building Project Ducks in a Row. You've heard the phrase, to get your ducks in a row. The aim of this presentation is to give you an understanding of what the key phases, or ducks, are for church building project development, so that your project can run smoothly and so you do not miss out a vital step. Here are the different phases or ducks involved, but in a random pattern. Have a look at each heading. Which do you think should come first? The order may surprise you. So this is the order the ducks should be in. Basics, vision, team, community engagement, evidence, DAC visit and faculty process, fundraising, project development, project delivery, and evaluation. How did you get on? When working with parishes, they are often surprised by how far down the row fundraising comes. Next, we'll think about some of the things you need to think about with each duck. So, duck one, basics. Maintenance. This is so important, even if you are not planning a project. Keeping on top of minor repairs will mean that they don't become major repairs. For instance, it will cost a lot less to fix a few slipped slates than replace a roof. For further information, see the presentation on maintenance as part of this project. You may also like to look up the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, also known as SPAB, Faith in Maintenance Calendar. This sets out which tasks should be done month by month. Rainwater goods. Keep an eye on the state of the gutters and downpipes and make sure that water can get away from the building. Water getting into the building fabric is a primary cause of damp and decay, leading to expensive repairs. Look at the building when it's raining. Are there any points where rainwater is coming out of the top of a drain pipe or spilling over a gutter? This can indicate a blockage. Are drains blocked with leaves or free flowing? It is a good idea to work with a local contractor to come and clear the gutters once leaves have fallen. Make sure that there is good ventilation throughout the building by opening hopper heads in the windows, keeping the door open if possible during the summer months and ensuring that air bricks are not blocked. Again, see the presentation on maintenance for more information. Quinquennial inspections also known as QIs, are a requirement every five years and are carried out by the parish architect or surveyor. These show what maintenance and repair items will be required immediately and over a five-year period and help parishes to plan a programme of works. Inventory. This is the document compiled by the church wardens of the parish that lists everything that's in the building. Photographs are useful to be able to identify items. It's also a good idea to have a record of furniture and fittings, including stained glass windows and memorials. These should be reviewed annually to add anything that's been acquired and check that nothing is missing. Curb appeal. Stand at the roadside and look at the church with fresh eyes. Does it look loved and cared for? Is it obvious where the path is? Is the churchyard well kept? If you're letting the grass grow for ecological reasons, let people know that and explain how many different species of butterfly, etc. have been seen. If you were visiting for the first time, would you want to go in? Open and welcome. 
try and have the church building open as much as possible. Many people may not want to come to a church service, but will come into a church for a quiet time of peace and reflection. With a few careful checks, many churches can be open in daylight hours without people needing to sit there all day. Ecclesiastical insurance prefers churches to be open and they have a very helpful guidance note. So now duck two, vision. Think about why you are wanting to do this project. Remember funders will not necessarily know you or your settlement. You're going to need to sell your vision to them. More importantly, you also need to have a well thought through vision so that you can bring your local community with you. It will be necessary to say more than we need to fix the roof or we need a loo and servery. You need to explain why. What is it about the building that makes it special? Beyond its list description that there's been a church on the site for X hundreds of years. You need to be confident about why you are doing this project now and why it's needed now. Have you asked your wider community for their opinions? What would they like to see happen in the church building and in the wider community? Can you weave this into the project? Do not have a set idea and then expect the wider community to get involved. Instead, involve others in the community from the beginning in building the foundations for the project. Your project will be stronger for it and will be more likely to be successful. Start by thinking about how you are called to be the church in this place now and how this might change over the next year, two years, five years and 10 years and beyond. Is development planned for your settlement? How have you engaged with the Time to Change Together process? Be realistic about how this vision will come to fruition, but also be prepared for your vision to change as you pray about it and work with your wider community. Is the basis of your project a nice to have, an essential thing that must happen, can you justify this? Or a pipe dream? Log everything that happens in your buildings, in your church and the wider community, and in your settlement and neighbouring settlements. This will help you see what is already taking place and stop you duplicating effort, but can also help you identify the gaps the what isn't happening, the unmet need, the what you have to travel elsewhere for if you have access to transport. Think about where your infrastructure is like water, electricity, gas and drainage. Will any of these need to be installed or upgraded? Factor this into your project planning early as there may be waiting lists and additional costs to be connected to infrastructure networks. Dream big and don't worry about the budget to start with. Projects are better in the long term if you can show you have considered all the possibilities. This shows you have thought everything through, can justify your ideas and show why this project is relevant and necessary for your building or community now. So to duck three, team. You cannot carry out a church building project on your own. You will need a team around you. So who have you got already? Carry out a skills audit and widen this to your community and think about others who might be able to work in partnership with you. At a minimum, you need people with leadership skills financial skills and administrative skills. When you have got your working group together, 
make sure everyone knows what they are responsible for and who they are reporting to. Clear communication within the group is essential. Depending on the nature of the project, it may well be necessary to have an architect or surveyor involved. Depending on the size or cost of the project, you may need to go through a procurement process to appoint them. The church buildings team can advise further on this. Essentially, you need to write a brief outlining what the project will entail and any other work that you might want the professional to carry out in the future, such as the quinquennial inspection. This is then advertised for free on the Church Care website, asking anyone who wants to apply to submit an expression of interest. You then review these, ask those you would like to interview to submit a tender for the work, and from that choose your shortlist. We always recommend interviewing at least three people. You will soon know if you can work with them and whether they will listen and be able to turn your vision into reality. It will not be necessary for the architect to be at every meeting and could be costly, although circulate the minutes to them so that they are kept up to date with what is happening. You might want to consider setting up a friends group which can support the building and wider events that happen in it, but will not necessarily be involved with the worship that takes place. There are useful resources available detailing the different types of constitution, but whichever version you go for, make sure that there are clear reporting lines to the PCC and that it is clear that the PCC still has to make decisions about the building and what happens in it. It is vital that you keep a record of the amount of hours spent on project work, as this shows what kind of commitment people are making and can count as match funding with some funders, such as the National Lottery Heritage Fund. This soon adds up. So to duck for community engagement. To expand a bit more on community engagement, it's important to identify what's already happening so that you can see if your project is duplicating something that's already happening or is filling a gap. Think about what happens elsewhere. So for instance, does the village hall have to turn away bookings or is it rarely used? So is there a need for more generic community space? Try to complement what is already taking place so as not to compete or cause unnecessary conflict. Think about where information is shared in your village. Is there a notice board everyone looks at? A village Facebook page? The parish council website? The post office queue? Or via those waiting to pick up children at school? How are you going to get information out to people? If you're using social media, remember to make your posts public and to share them with other local sites. You will need to post multiple times in the run-up to the event. Include a welcome, such as, looking forward to seeing as many as possible at our event and to hearing your ideas on what somewhere St Hypothetical can do for you. Make sure you include a date, time and venue do not assume everyone will know where you're talking about. If you're putting up posters, where will get the most footfall? Think about what questions you might ask at an event, such as, how did they find out about you? Or is there something else that they would like to see happen in church or in the wider community? Can you use your space to host other community events? Remember to ask for contact details to follow up and remember GDPR legislation about keeping people's personal details safe. However you share information, it's vital that this source is kept up to date or people will lose interest and will be less likely to want to be involved. Remember that you may find you have to adapt your vision as a result of community feedback.
This can be a good way to show funders that you have listened and are engaged with your wider community, not just your church congregation. If there's a local event happening, attend it if you can. Think fates, village fairs, agricultural shows, engage in conversations. And keep a note of how many people you talked with and how you asked for their opinion. Also, never underestimate the power of tea and cake. So to duck five, evidence. You will need to be able to show why it is necessary to do your project now and just having the idea to do it is not sufficient. Is it being done elsewhere? How have you reached your vision? Remember duck two? This is the point that you gather all you have recorded from community engagement and scoping exercises to provide evidence that you have engaged with a wider group. Note who you have asked, what you have asked them and when. Show what research you have carried out. Depending on the type of project, information on where your parish is on the index of multiple deprivation can be useful, along with population figures. The index of multiple deprivation combines widely used data sets to measure poverty levels. Multiple components of deprivation are weighted with different strengths to reach a single score of deprivation. You can also look at the subsets of data, which include health, housing, employment and education. This is where you can show how many people came to events, if possible showing growth, but we appreciate that there is a pandemic impact as people are reluctant to engage in person. Consider carrying out audits of the building on what you will do in it. Is the building accessible? Can everyone be included in worship? Remember, not everyone will be able to see to read a screen or a standard font size service book. Are you able to open your church building regularly? And is it welcoming when people get inside? And if you were visiting for the first time, would you want to go in? Have a look at your curb appeal. In summary, show how you have reached your vision. So to duck six, the DAC visit and the faculty process. Stephen Slight, the DAC and Pastoral Secretary, and Pete Duff, Assistant DAC and Pastoral Secretary, the DAC officers, are happy to help and it's worth dropping them an email or giving them a ring if you are unsure what to do when submitting an application for a faculty or what level of permission works need. You might also like to refer to the training videos with the Diocesan Advisory Committee officers about the online faculty system and quick wins with the DAC. These will explain the whole process in much more detail. Engaging with the DAC early is a vital for the success of your project. Ask for opinion before you have formal plans drawn up. The DAC is made up of volunteers with lots of experience in matters church building related and have seen many projects across the diocese. They can come to visit to advise. You will need to write a statement of significance and a statement of need. The statement of significance outlines what is important about the building and its setting. The statement of need sets out why you need to change the building what impact the changes will have, and why these outweigh the significance of the building. This process will help clarify your thinking and focus your minds on what is important and necessary. As you will have formed your vision and gathered your evidence, these need not be daunting. Remember that the DAC can only advise the Chancellor, they do not make the final decision. There is a further process after a matter has left the DAC, as it's then passed on to the diocesan registrar for a decision by the Chancellor. So to duck seven, finally, fundraising. 
You may like to refer to the more in-depth training video about how to make grant funding applications, but in summary, note how far through the process fundraising comes. Start by reading all the guidance notes, twice. Each funder has different guidance, so be wary of cutting and pasting. Some support community, but not faith or religion. However, if your project is community-based, you can still apply. Working out a fundraising strategy, who you are applying to and when, will help you juggle deadlines and cash flow. Remember that most funders will not fund a project that has already started, so think about phasing your project if you cannot get everything done at the same time. Give yourself enough time to write your application bids. They take time and should not be rushed, so that you give yourself the best opportunity to reach the top of the pile and get some funding. Get someone not connected to the bid to read your application. Do they understand your vision, your language, the point of the application? Be specific. Think about the Kipling poem about six honest serving men. What, why, when, how, where, who. Waffle will not get you a grant. It may get you rejected. Assume that your funder knows nothing about who you are or where your project is. Even if you have been working with a project officer, remember your application is likely to go to a board of trustees for a decision. Think formatting. Does your application work on different computers? Don't use fancy fonts and check your word limits. Short sentences are easier to read and get your point across. Get your finances right on paper, almost more important than the words. If you cannot add up and understand the costings of your project, this will be obvious to a funder who will not entrust their money with you. Think of other fundraising opportunities, such as concerts, coffee mornings, etc. Raise money for the church fabric, not for the church roof. Can the PCC put any money in? Talk with other parishes that have done similar projects about how they raised funds. So to duck eight, project development. This stage can seem like a bit of a luxury, but can lead to a stronger finished project. We know that finding funding for feasibility studies can be a struggle, but the more information you have before the main project starts, the more successful it will be. For instance, if you want to raise awareness of your project and test to see if you have capacity to put on a concert, coffee morning or lunch club, run a trial event or two. You may need to find some more volunteers to help. Also, if your project is to do with church fabric, then the more investigation that can take place beforehand, the more prepared you will be when works start on site. We have known churches that have had to replace more roof timbers than they thought when the roof was stripped back, as they had not investigated for rot before the main project started. Keep gathering the evidence. Remember Duck 5. If you have to change the project as a result of this project development stage, funders are more likely to be supportive if they can see why. Think about how you are going to make your project sustainable throughout its life and after the project has finished. This is not just about environmental impact, but also the people needed to run events, being able to adapt to changing circumstances, not just a global pandemic, but local developments and changes in key personnel, for instance. So now, Duck Nine, you're finally at project delivery. You've done the planning, the fundraising, the testing, and you can finally start that main project. Keep an eye on the cash flow, and remember that many funders pay in arrears once work has taken place. If you have a Gantt chart, which shows tasks against a timeline with projected costs, this will make the project proceed much more smoothly. This also shows funders that you have thought through the project in detail including a breakdown of tasks, when they are to take place, and what the cost will be. The church buildings team can show you examples. Just get in touch. 
If you have building works on site, these will mostly be led by the architect in conjunction with the main contractor, but everyone needs to be aware of the health and safety implications. Are you going to need to close the church to visitors? How much notice is needed for funerals and weddings? It is vital to keep the community up to date with what is happening, especially if there is going to be any disruption. Work in progress photographs on social media work well, as does a short article in the parish magazine. If possible, involve your community in the works with hard hat tours and time to talk with those doing the work on site. Don't forget to keep all invoices, as you'll need these to claim grant funds, and keep track of what you have spent. You can reclaim the VAT via the listed Places of Worship grant scheme. Get your first application in early, as it can take time to process. So once you have spent £1,000 on VAT, put your claim in. And now the last duck, duck 10, evaluation. This stage will be easier if you have gathered evidence as you have gone through and thought about evaluation throughout. Funders such as the National Lottery Heritage Fund will expect you to spend a certain amount of your grant on evaluation. So, how did the project go? Were there any unexpected developments? Did you have to adapt or change something? How many events did you run? What were they? How many people came? How did they engage with the event or your building? Would they come again? Remember I said to keep a note of volunteer hours and numbers? This is where all that data gets put together. Remember to thank the funders for the grant. Invite them to celebration events or send them a report, detailing what a difference their funding has made to the outcomes. And celebrate! You've done a lot to get to the end of the project. Pause and reflect on how far you have come and the difference that this project has made to you, your community, your special building. But then, keep going. Don't lose all that expertise, goodwill, experience. Think about what you and the wider community might want to do next. So, is there anything that surprised you about the order of ducks? Some of the phases, or ducks, carry on swimming along with other phases such as basics, community engagement, evidence gathering. It's important to get a clear project outline informed by evidence that it is actually needed. So think about how you can be even more involved with your community. Are there ways you can share your heritage with others? Can you get involved with the expanding tourist economy in this county? If you start applying for funding before your vision is properly worked out, you will not get the funding as funders will see that you have not thought the project through. You will also lose momentum and will wind up with confusion in your congregation and wider community and that ends up with resentment building. It can waste time and money by missing out a step. If your maintenance is not kept up to date, you can wind up with a more expensive project. Mending a slip slate or two is a few hundred. Having to replace more of the roof because the roof timbers have rotten due to water ingress is more than a few thousand. There's no point putting in beautiful new facilities if the roof is leaking. The church buildings team can give you a lot of advice. We have surgery sessions for individual parishes and can often put you in touch with other parishes who've been through similar projects before. There are resources out there for further study, including the Crossing the Threshold Toolkit. This was updated by the HRBA from the original made by the Diocese of Hereford. It sets out in handy, usable chapters how to run church building projects, gives you lots of ideas and has some good case study examples. So, if watching any of these videos or reading through any of the resources has sparked an idea or a question for you, please do get in touch with the Church Buildings team. We are happy to signpost you further.
Thank you for watching this training video. Do have a look at others in the series and if you have any questions, please contact us at the Church Buildings team.